Hey everybody, Matt Colville here. Less than 48 hours left in this Kickstarter. We end Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And wow, I am looking forward to this thing being over. I just like to make videos about other stuff. I uh, got a lot of stuff in the pike that I'm eager to share with you folks, including, you know, a 2001 video. I want to do a Shape of Water video. I want to take some of the live streams that we've done on Saturday nights and sort of redo them just for YouTube to get the signal to noise ratio down. And I want to talk about backgrounds in d and I want to talk about initiative. There's a whole bunch of, a uh, whole bunch more I'd like to do. But right now, the Kickstarter is live only for a few hours more. Also, my friend Lars wanted to let me you know that we have sizes for the shirts including women's and tall sizes so there'll be a link in the doobly-doo to those I don't know why but apparently this like based purely on the Lars insisting that I cover this in a video I have to assume that this is something lots of people have been asking for this video we're covering the appendix to strongholds and followers which is the basic version of my warfare rules as you know you can attract units units of uh, uh, you know companies of soldiers as part of the rewards for rolling on the follower chart and several of your artisan followers can can improve your units or make it easier to attract units and ambassadors make it easier to buy units from other other races having an army is a big part of the fantasy therefore it's a big part of the system and I figured we should cover this and this is one of those videos where we're gonna see people in the comments below having you know really really highly developed opinions regarding how stuff like this should work so before we get into the meat of the system I just want to address the assumptions because I think it's important both as a consumer and as a potential future playtester that we understand what the intent of a system is I think two good things to think about as a designer are one what is the fantasy we're trying to fulfill and then two what kind of behavior are we trying to reward on the part of the players? The first assumption the system makes is that not everyone wants to control an army or raise an army or fight a war. There is a reason that neither third nor fourth nor fifth edition have ever had any official, uh, no official source book. Often we'll get like an Arnold Arcana article about how to do mass combat, about how to do warfare. And that's because they have, I believe correctly, identified that warfare is not core to this fantasy RPG experience that we're all participating in. Folks who show up at your table to play, and I've said this in other videos, they want to roll dice and kill stuff by and large. And they are hoping that over the course of doing so, interesting moments, interesting character moments will evolve regarding making tough and important choices and meeting interesting NPCs and forming relationships with them and the other characters. All of those things are important, but actually every time I, trying to fulfill my own fantasies regarding the place I think warfare holds in the game, try to foist that kind of thing on my players, I discover this is hard fought, this lesson. Uh, it took me a long time to really internalize it, but only a couple of players in any group I've ever played with are really interested in raising an army and fighting a war. And in fact, some players find it a distasteful distraction. They're really not interested in that kind of thing. They are happy rolling dice and killing stuff and collecting magic items and, and you know, so saving the world and going on quests. These are things that are important to them and they're not really interested in warfare. So that's why this system and the uh, fourth edition version of it as well is opt in. There is no requirement on a, a part of any given player to decide I want to do this. Just like the stronghold system in general. No one has to build a stronghold and as and no one has to fight a war if they don't want to. As a result, the system does not assume that a battle, meaning a conflict between units of soldiers, is going to exist as its own thing separate from an encounter in which you're rolling dice and killing monsters. Because this is 100% what everyone at your table showed up for. Therefore, a battle happens at the same time as an encounter. You can watch uh, somewhere on my YouTube channel, there's the Battle of Castle Rend, which I think actually went really well. And it shows how every time there is a battle, there is also an encounter. And the Strongholds and Followers book will have rules for how to build this and how to sync these things up. So that, in other words, when the evil bad guy army shows up, there is an evil bad guy whose miniature is gonna be in the encounter, and there, he's gonna have his own ally minions and stuff that are gonna fight in the encounter with your players. Meanwhile, outside the castle or, you know, uh, in the forest or wherever, there's going to be a huge clash of arms. And these two things are related to each other. I did it once with uh, my friend Dave who built a tower, Valoran's Tower. There was a battle of Valoran's Tower. And so there was an actual, I had a tower miniature and there was the leader of the army trying to kill uh, the leader of the heroes while surrounding them in their ta surrounding the tower, these two armies fought. And in the full version of the rules, there are, uh, in the full, in, the, in kingdoms and warfare, there's going to be rules, more detailed rules for how 
each of these two things affects the other. So they're not completely firewalled from one another. But I think for the basic version of the rules in Strongholds and Followers, we're going to try to avoid getting lost in the reads and try to keep things relatively straightforward and simple. So that's the first assumption. The first assumption is, unless you're doing a one-on-one -on -one or a two-on-one -on -one game with players that you know are purely interested in warfare, in which case you can just use these units and resolve the battle dramatically, every battle also has an encounter. And players in that encounter can ignore the battle. They don't have to command units if they don't want to. Now, the nice thing about it being opt-in, the nice thing about it being like, well, balance-wise, you know, none of these units refresh until all of them have acted. So uh, if you, Craig, don't want to command a unit, that's fine. We're not losing any actions. You can just concentrate on trying to stop the bad guy enemy leader and the uh, monsters that he's brought with him. But what I have discovered is having made it opt-in, every battle I've run since then, all the players opt in. When they don't have to, when they don't feel obligated to manage a unit, the units are just, they're cards, they sit there off to the side of the table, there's no um, there's no positioning, there's no, uh, we're, not in, we're not manipulating these units in 2D space trying to figure out exactly where they are in the battlefield, the battle is abstracted. When that is true, players who initially thought they weren't that interested, they get done with the end of their turn, they've rolled some dice and they've maybe done something cool, cast a spell, and now they're like, well, you know, there is this uh, there is this unit of dwarven heavy infantry. I, mean, I should just I should just make an attack roll with them and have them see if they can do something. And that is exciting. It's exciting for me to watch the players engage with it that way. So far, it has not failed. Of course, my sample size is not statistically significant, but it's what I got. So assumption number one, the battle is opt in. It's up to the player to decide if they want to control any units. Assumption number two is that it takes soldiers to hold the field. In fact, this sentiment is expressed in my first novel where the main character, Hayden, is trying to save this keep that is about to be sieged by orcs. And they, when the people in this keep discover that if this were in, in that in Dungeons and Dragons terms, the main character is like 13th or 15th level. They suddenly think he can save us. He, you could bless you could bless our soldiers. You can make one man fight like 50. And the main character has to express something that he learned from a much more experienced general, which is ultimately it takes men to hold the field. I know that there are players out there. I've seen this. I've seen this in comments on forums going all the way back to, uh, you know, the first edition of these rules that I published back in, I don't know, 2001 or 2002 that uh, uh, there are players who believe that their fifth level wizard should be able to completely decimate an army and that there isn't anything the army can do. And if that is your fantasy, if that's the assumption that you have built in, the system is not for you. The system assumes that it takes men to hold the field, that powerful spellcasters can do interesting things. But one given unit of soldiers is typically about 100 people. And as a result, even a fireball, it'll kill some of them. It'll scatter some of them. But the rest of them are just going to be like, what happened way over there? A unit of soldiers is not packed into the maximally smallest spot. And so even something like a fireball, it may inflict a casualty on a unit, but it's not going to wipe out an entire army. Although I know there are players for whom that's their fantasy, in which case you don't really need any kind of system, I don't think. I think that can be purely handled narratively through uh, you and the Dungeon Master. I remember uh, my friend Brad in the earliest version of his system. So this would have been uh, Brad's the Dungeon Master that I've spent my career trying to emulate. He, uh, We were talking about this. We were teenagers. And one of the players asked, I don't understand, if I have an iron golem, which one iron golem is a unit on its own in the system, if I have an iron golem, why doesn't it just wipe out every army? And Brad's response was, no, it'll it'll be really effective for a little while, but eventually the thousands of soldiers that it's facing will figure out they can just get some big heavy chains and tie it to a giant boulder, and that's the end of the iron golem. And that may seem ridiculous to you, but it was convincing to me. I, in my mind, I could imagine that, and I said, yeah, that makes sense. So it takes men to hold the field. A single spellcaster is not going to do it. And also that the, the winner is the army that holds morale. And this is a fact of every war that's ever been fought, basically. You go all the way back to Clausewitz on war. Morale holds the day. So you'll see that one of the things you often are doing in this system is you're making morale checks. You're not just attacking. That's a big part of it. But you're also making morale checks. So a unit can disband. A unit can be taken off the field like a casualty. Basically, a unit can disband even though not all the soldiers in it are dead. In fact, that's typical. It's typical that some of the soldiers have 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 broken morale. They've literally basically become shell shocked and they've run fleeing, especially peasant levies, especially human peasant levies will tend to run screaming. But also, 
part of this unit is just disorganized. They're no longer able to maintain unit cohesion. They're no longer sure who's in charge. They're no longer even sure exactly which direction they should be facing or which enemy they should be attacking. So they haven't, they haven't, they're not cowards. They're not running in terror, but they're no longer organized enough to be effective as a unit. And that's the typical end of any given unit. I think now you have an idea of the basic assumptions of the system, which ideally will help you make smart choices in whether or not to back this project. Because if you listen to that and you listen to the rest of the video and you're like, actually, this system doesn't sound anything like what I want, then it's not for you. That's that's I want to make sure that we end up producing the product that people want and we don't end up with a whole bunch of people buying something that they're dissatisfied with at the end. Now I want to talk about the fan, the core fantasy of the system. And this is very personal to me, but it's I'm, I'm the designer, I'm the author. So it has to it has to work on me first and then hopefully work on other people. And that is I love I always have seeing a list, uh, seeing an army list and seeing the units described as, for instance, Dwarven Elite Heavy Cavalry. Actually, I don't know. Dwarven Cavalry, what would they be riding? Goats? That would be cool. That would be, yeah, sure, yeah. Dwarven Goat Riders. But you get the idea. Super Elite Elven Light Archers, for instance. When I see a unit described in those terms, it just gets my brain firing. All this imagination happens. And I, I want that promise that each of those terms is mechanically significant. And that, for instance, a, a unit of Dwarven Heavy Infantry is substantively different than a unit of Human Heavy Infantry. All other things being the same, your ancestry is important to the way the unit behaves. That is the core fantasy for me. So that's why a big part of this system, it's kind of like a lot of players, I, I enjoy seeing this, it doesn't matter how old you are, if you've never played or what generation you're from, some players open the player's handbook and they see this list of weapons and they get this fantasy that each of these weapons is somehow meaningfully different than the others and that your character will be different if you pick a halberd as, a, as opposed to if you pick a pike. Even though they're very similar weapons, the fantasy is that there's some meaningful difference between them. That's the promise of a big list like that, and that's the promise of this system and the way it treats different units. Also, I should mention that there is, there's the basic version of the warfare rules, but there's also simple warfare, which is just a couple of die rolls and a couple of charts you roll on percentile dice, where the dungeon master and the players just figure out what are the units involved in the battle, what are the advantages and disadvantages we have, like dwarves fighting in the mountains, or a unit defending its home. These give you bonus to the die roll and you just make a couple of die rolls and it tells you how many casualties the different armies took and who wins and who loses and you don't have to do any of this stuff it's actually very simple straightforward takes 10 or 15 minutes to resolve a battle because again you're just rolling percentile dice to see who takes which casualties so there are these simple warfare rules then there are the basic warfare rules which is the appendix and eventually you get a whole book called kingdoms and warfare so what is a unit? Well, let's take a look at one. Let's show off exactly how this system works. You already know how you can get units. You can roll on your follower chart and some will arrive and pledge service to you. Or you could just buy some if you wanted. You automatically get some if you finish a keep as opposed to a tower or an establishment or a temple. These are the Ironheart Defenders. This is a unit of Dwarven Seasoned Medium Infantry. Each of those terms, by the way, is significant to the way the unit functions. Dwarves fight different than elves, fight different than humans. Seasoned is how much experience they have. Medium is how heavy their gear and weapons are. And then infantry has a specific role in the battle. When you want to make an attack with a unit, the first thing you do is you pick a target. And there are rules for which targets each unit can pick. And those are described in the doobly-doo. It's called the order of battle. These guys, for instance, they make an attack roll. They roll plus nine to their roll. And they're trying to beat the target's defense. And that is relatively straightforward. That's just like an attack roll against armor class and this is basically down to how heavy the weapons are and how good these these this unit's training is but then after that we make another roll this is a power roll. You roll power versus a target's toughness. And the reason we do this gets down to the history of wargaming and how uh, playing an RPG is different. In a role-playing game, you are playing one character, right? So it's reasonable in a role-playing game to track hit points and have, for instance, 73 hit points. And then someone does 16 points of damage to you. And you have to sit there going, okay, what's 16 from 73? And you do, uh, and maybe you got to do some on the right scribble on paper. And then you go, okay. And then you end up with how much, either how much damage you've accumulated over the battle or how many hit points you have left. Depending depending on the tradition you are from. But the RPG is basically roll, sometimes that fails, but when it succeeds, roll, that rarely results in killing something, but eventually when you go through the cycle enough, you will kill the unit. 
This system works basically the same way. You roll to see if you hit, then you just make another roll to see if your if the if the strength of your unit is great enough to overcome the enemy unit's toughness, how hardy it is in battle, and if that second roll is successful, then you decrement the uh you 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 take the unit's size and you reduce it by one. So in this sense, size is sort of like hit points, except there's no math, there's no subtraction, there's no damage roll, and that's because when you're running one character, it's perfectly reasonable to expect the player to do math. But when you've got a whole bunch of units on the field, it starts to be a little bit more tedious to have to keep track of hit points for each of them and be making damage rolls that result in doing math. So there's no math here. There's no subtraction. There's no adding to your total damage or subtracting from your total hit points. Each unit has, well, this is one of the more important things. Each unit has a size. These guys, have a, the Ironheart Defenders are a D6. And so you literally take the card for the unit and they'll be printed in the Strongholds and Followers book. You'll be able to photocopy them. You'll be able to make your own. You put it on the table. Remember the battle is notional. We're not worried about the positioning of the units. And you take a six sided die, you stick it on the unit with the six facing up. And that means they start at maximum size. You can have units that are very small. They have a D4. Units that are very large might be a D12. This keeps the battle relatively simple and straightforward because instead of saying, oh, I've got three units of Ironheart Defenders, no, you've got one unit of Ironheart Defenders that can be very large, representing many companies of soldiers. So the die starts at its maximum, and every time an enemy unit succeeds in an attack test, which then creates a power test and they succeed at that, you decrement the die by one. You go, it goes from six to five. It makes it very easy to look at the battle and see which, how big the units are, because you can just see their dice, right? If there's a unit out there that's got a 12-sided die on it, you're like, that is a huge unit. We have to focus on that. It's going to take a long time to kill, right? Which is something you would be able to tell just looking at the battle. And then you can also tell very easily how close all of these units are to being destroyed, because you just look at the facings on the die. This is something I have seen not, I don't think people get confused by this. I just know that some people don't like it. They like tracking hit points, they sort of assume, especially if D&D is the only game like this they've ever played, that all things should have hit points. Uh, but you have this. The, I've played a lot of war games, especially old school war games, and one of the things you learn is that tracking, you, tracking hit points with multiple units, the way you do a character, becomes incredibly tedious very quickly, and it is mathematically equivalent. It's not mathematically identical. You'll see people down in the doobly-doo trying to reverse engineer all the math. It's not mathematically identical, but it's basically roll to hit, roll to hit, this often misses. When it succeeds, you make a damage roll. With a character, that damage roll then requires math, with, and, and it will rarely result in a casualty. And similarly here, when you make a damage roll, uh, it often fails. And when it succeeds, you just decrement the size die. And as a result, eventually, in both instances, it's going to be roll, miss, roll, miss, roll, hit, uh, roll, uh, roll damage, roll damage, it doesn't die, roll damage, it doesn't die, roll damage, it does die. Each unit also has a morale stat. We talked about how morale works, and there are a couple of common instances where a unit has to make a morale test. For instance, if they are exposed to battle magic, which is these almost like epic level spells that you cast, that freaks soldiers out. Soldiers are not, they're typically, you know, uh, they started as peasants and they signed up to fight. They put down their plowshares, they picked up weapons, they started as peasant levies and worked their way up until eventually they were veterans. And it's something that soldiers are, different species react to this differently. Some are more prone to break and running when they see a swarm of fireballs fly over the battle. But also, units can become diminished, which is something, it's, it's uh, this system's version of bloodied from 4th edition. If, for instance, the Ironheart Defenders that start at 6, when the casualty die reads 3 or less, from that, which means, in other words, they've taken half their size in casualties, from that point forward, anytime they take damage, they also have to make a morale test. Morale accelerates losing because it just gets harder and harder to maintain unit cohesion as the unit takes damage and becomes scattered and the soldiers become confused. Are we winning? Are we losing? Who are we supposed to attack? So there is a point, there's a threshold after which every time you fail a power test, you, you're going to make a morale test. And if you fail that, you decrement your die one more time. So it's possible to take two casualties as a result of one attack. That's unusual, actually, because several things have to fail. You have to fail both your attack test, you have to fail your power test, and then you have to fail a morale test. But especially with smaller units, especially with a unit that's only a D4, it can be huge. Then we get on to the different traits the units have. These Ironheart Defenders are made of sterner stuff. 
Enemy battle magic has disadvantage on power tests because these are the Ironheart defenders. They are used to fighting mages. And you already know how disadvantage works. They also have stand your ground. This is something you turn on once per battle. I would imagine typically when the unit is diminished, meaning you're starting to get worried that they're going to break and run. And for the next round, all successful enemy power tests have to be re-rolled. So like when reinforcements show up or when the unit becomes diminished or when you can see that the enemy is going to focus fire on the Ironheart defenders, they turn this ability on and it just for one round, it makes them incredibly hard to kill. They also have something a little similar to like a Berserker Rage called That Just Made Them Angry. It gives them advantage on attack tests when they are diminished and enemy power tests have disadvantage. So this is something that fights against that tendency once a unit is diminished to just break morale and run. These guys become even more committed to the battle. They have seen their allies die in battle and it's kind of, it's 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 strengthened their resolve. These stats all come from a, an Excel spreadsheet I have that I've done a ton of work in that has a little drop down menus where I can say, okay, what is the race and what is their training and what kind of gear do they have? And that gives me the basics for their stats. But and I'm not going to expose that Excel sheet, by the way, because once I've done that, I then compare it to all the other units like it and the units that it are, it's probably going to be fighting against. And I start tweaking the numbers to make sure that even though there's math, the math is done kind of blind. The system doesn't know, uh, you know, exactly how I intend to balance things. And so I hand massage the numbers and that part is important. And the Stronghold and Followers books, the appendix, the Warfare appendix will come with tons of units that you can recruit. Let's compare those guys to the blue Dragonflight. Now, you'll notice that the Ironheart Defenders, and there's a PDF with both of these units in it, the Ironheart Defenders didn't have a cost because I just awarded them to the players based on the things the players have done in role-playing. And that's pretty typical for the way I run the first battle in a campaign is I put on the table which enemy units are coming, marching against them to destroy them. And the players look at this and they're like, oh my word, like, how do we get units? And I say to them, I don't know. How are you going to get units? And every time I've done that, it, it, it works. They don't freak out. They don't get frustrated and give up. They, they say, OK, they start thinking about what have we done and who have we met that might have something like an army they can lend us. This is my favorite part of the warfare system, actually, even though it has nothing to do with the mechanics of it, is watching the players sit there thinking, who are our allies? But then once they've run through their allies, they start thinking about who among the people they're not allied with, which of those people, like, like a, in one campaign, my players went and there was an orc chieftain, Blood Rager Katakav, who they had, they had sort of avoided. And as a result, they were able to go to him and say, hey, let's make a deal. It was a sandbox style of game where he was one of the possible different quests they could go on, but they never went on that quest. So they never really upset that character. And they were able to go to him and negotiate and make a deal. And that was a ton of fun. And as a result, I had already thought about all of this, by the way. I already had units behind the screen ready for everything they thought of. So far, my players have never surprised me in that regard. And you'd be surprised at, at how easy it is for you to think of all the different units they could recruit. But they've never done this before. And they're kind of like, they feel like they're grasping for straws, but they're they're not. They're just playing through all the stuff they've done in the campaign, all the people they've met that you put there for a reason. And they're thinking, who among these people can we exploit and get some units out of? And that creates a lot of awesome negotiation. You know, like I remember the players in my Night Below campaign, they didn't expect this to happen, but a unit of Zverf Nibelin, a unit of deep gnomes showed up to help them because they had done a lot for the queen of the gnomes. They thought that those guys were too far away. It didn't even occur to them to go talk to the deep gnomes, but I like the idea that the deep gnomes kind of keep an eye on the characters because they like these guys. And so in the moment, of crisis, a unit of deep gnomes show up. So the Ironheart defenders don't have a cost because I just awarded them narratively based on the things the characters had done in the campaign. But you'll see the blue dragonflight does have a cost and actually 390 points is an expensive unit because the blue dragonflight are dragonborn, super elite, super heavy infantry. Super elite, super heavy means they are the most highly trained units you can get and they are the most heavily equipped. There aren't a lot of these guys. I think there were only like 12 of them in the actual game, but that, you know, one iron golem can be a unit unto itself, just like a hundred peasants can be a unit unto themselves, just like 12 fifth level dragonborn paladins can be a unit unto themselves. And this is such a fantastic tool. Narratively, you meet this order of knights in the world and they're recalcitrant and they've, they're have they kind of doing their own thing and you try to help them out and maybe you succeed. And as a result, you leave with this tenuous alliance with them. And many levels later, they show up to help you. And these guys, they're, they're badass. Compare their stats to the Ironheart defenders and you will see that these guys are almost unstoppable. Like, look at their morale test. These guys are going to be making a lot of morale checks, but look at their size. Because they are a small unit of knights, they're only a D4. 
But because they are good King Omen's dragon phalanx, and in fact, the blue dragonflight were the last. They were the lost dragonflight that, you know, good King Omen is long dead, and the players found these guys and made allies of them. Their first ability is just straight up, we cannot be diminished. In other words, when they're D4, and you think that's really small, these guys are going to be making a lot of morale tests once they're diminished. When their D4 gets to two, that doesn't mean anything special. They don't have to make a morale test at that point when they take damage the way a normal unit would. They are lore-wise. They have advantage on morale tests against battle magic because they are also spellcasters. They're all, each one of them is like a paladin mage, a paladin cleric. They're all multi-classed. And these guys are used to using and having battle magic used against them. It does not freak them out. Then we get to a new mechanic for omened is the trait because, again, and these guys are good King Omen's Dragon Knights. It's a reaction, which means you can use it when it's not your turn. Specifically, you use it when you take casualties, and it says casualty equals two. So when the casualty die for the Blue Dragon Flight goes from three to two, at that point, whatever attack did that to them, they get to react to. They get to make a rally test, which is a morale test. You roll, add plus nine. If they beat a 15, which they're probably going to, then they get to increment the casualty die. They get to reform the unit, and those members of the Blue Dragon Flight that are a little disoriented, wait, who are we supposed to be attacking? I think, and maybe they've gotten an argument, right? These are proud knights and maybe they're not, maybe they think it's time to, maybe who, are we working for the right person? You make a rally test and they go, no, everything's fine. And they increment the casualty die, which means it can be really hard to break this unit. Every time they get to two, there's a chance they go back up to three. So for something like that, because I don't want it to be impossible to kill the blue dragonfly, although it should be very, very unlikely, I might say they can only do that once per battle. All this stuff, all this stuff, all of it is going to get play tested a lot, I hope. And finally, they are shock troops. This is a ability, actually lots of units have, uh, lots of bad guys guys have a unit of shock troops and it gives them advantage on their first attack test and first power test whenever they're fighting a given enemy unit. And you can imagine this, right? These heavily armored dragon men just smashing, charging and smashing into an enemy unit and it freaking that unit out. That's what shock troops do. They scare the hell out of the enemy, but it only works once against any given enemy unit because the charge is over. Now we're down to the meat and potatoes of slicing everybody up. There are lots of different units. It's going to be a lot of fun, I think, for folks to see what the different units are and how they work in the Strongholds and Followers. And of course, if this all works, if Strongholds and Followers is well received, there's going to be a whole book after this called Kingdoms and Warfare that is nothing except managing your realm and raising armies and fighting battles. There's a PDF in the doobly-doo that is the one-page handout I give to people. It doesn't describe how to raise units or how to design encounters or any of that stuff. That'll all be in the book. It is just a one-sheet I hand out to my players so they can read it and understand how the, it includes the order of battle, which units can attack which, and that is what makes infantry and cavalry and aerial units and archers important. For instance, anyone can attack infantry. That's their role. They're the meat shield in the order of battle. But enemy infantry cannot attack your archers until your infantry is gone. Archers can shoot at other archers. Aerial units can attack anyone. But your infantry cannot attack the enemy archers until you've chewed through the enemy infantry. That's the infantry's job is to protect the archers. There are also rules for siege engines and fortifications. And, you know, there are units that are siege engines. There's a unit of ants that are not only a unit you have to fight, but they act like siege engines. That's it, folks. That's the basic assumptions the warfare system makes. And we covered some of the things that I know people, some people wish it worked differently. Like, you know, your fifth level mage is not going to be able to wipe out an entire army of folks. And we talked about how units work and what their stats do. And we talked about the basic rules of warfare. If that sounds exciting to you, again, I think this book is for you, but if you're already objecting to some of the assumptions, then fair warning, you may need to find another warfare system. I don't, that's not, I don't consider that a criticism. That's just, an, it's uh, because I think we agree that warfare is not a core element of the rules. Any warfare system is going to be idiosyncratic. It's only going to appeal to a certain percentage of the, of the player base. I hope this one is robust enough to appeal to a lot of people, but I know it's not going to appeal to everybody. We have less than 48 hours left Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Time, then pencils down and I can make I can make other videos about other stuff I could finish the 2001 series I did a whole video on Hal that I scrapped because I wasn't happy with it want to do that again and I really want to do a video I promised a video on backgrounds and a video on initiative which is an incredibly power when to roll initiative is a very powerful tool in your narrative toolbox we're going to do a live stream Saturday night and I think Saturday night's live stream we're going to talk about the upcoming campaign and I will share with you folks the handouts and stuff I've given to the players already and some of the decisions the players have made this is the this is the campaign we are going to stream live for you folks once we found office space and we have one more video to do 
after this one and before that live stream, live stream Saturday night, probably around 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Although don't quote me on that. Sometimes it's 6.15, sometimes it's 6.30. It depends on how many problems I have to solve with my setup here. The other video we'll do, I'm going to try and get it done later today, is the some an example of the magic items that are going to be unique to this book. Really, we're going to talk about the Codex Terranosis and how it shows you the way I think about how these magic items should work, because it's a good example. I think there's like 12 codices in the Strongholds and Followers book, and then the only other magic items in there that will make sense for someone who's running a Stronghold. I'm trying to think of the most frequently asked questions I've gotten in the past couple days. I think the most common question I see online is people wanting to know, will they be able to get this book if they don't back the Kickstarter? Absolutely. They want to know what the prices are going to be. It's 20 bucks for the PDF. It's 30 bucks for the hardcover. And if you buy the hardcover, we if you buy it online, if you order it from us online, we will throw in the PDF for free at that point. As soon as the Kickstarter is over, you will be able to pre-order the books and you, then eventually they will come out and they'll be available in our online store. And I think that's it. Next video, we're going to talk about the Codex Terranosis, which like a lot of the codices is a real item that appeared in my world. And we'll talk about how it ended up being used, which was a lot of fun. And then Saturday night, the final uh, Kickstarter live stream, we're going to talk about the upcoming campaign. We're going to stream until then. Peace out.